Hello? Yeah. Hello, everybody. So thanks for having me today. Uh, so my name is uh, Wasim Swali. I am a cloud solution architect working with, with uh, Mirantis. And uh, today, we will be talking about building a framework for uh, big infra decisions. But before to start, so we are having a scavenger hunt with uh, Mirantis, so just collect uh, these QR codes and uh, come to collect your prizes at the beer garden, right? Um, I will be displaying it again at the end of the session, so there's no rush. <laughs> so, the shopping list. Uh, so basically, uh, we have met with a lot of uh, customers and uh, a lot of them are using so VMs or uh, containers, or uh, both of them. Of course, we have other solutions, but this is what we see uh, the most. So usually we are using VMs when we have like a lift and shift. So uh, customers, they are having like uh, servers and uh, they just want to optimize them. So they move everything to, to VMs, lift and shift, without uh, uh, doing anything. It's like minimum effort, right? And it works very good. Uh, it is also used while uh, using like a non-standard HTTP or HTTPS protocols. Uh, we see that especially in the telco, we have a colleague here, like telco expert, he will have another session to discuss about it. Uh, especially with uh, like SIP and diameter and GTP protocol, where we really, we really need like uh, point to point. So this is much easier to use VMs. Uh, and uh, also it's used uh, in order to run like different operating systems, especially like uh, if we develop with Windows and Linux, like with .NET or these kind of things, yeah, it's uh, much easier. Uh, so of course there are other reasons, but this is what we see on the field. Uh, in the uh, other hand, so a lot of our customers are using containers as well, and uh, especially if they start uh, from scratch. So of course if you have a code that exists from uh, uh, 10 years, which is like a, uh, uh, bug free, so you don't want to risk it and to uh, create something from scratch. But if you are a new company, so of course it's easier uh, in order to build something from scratch and use the, uh, 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 all the cloud native and like a DevSecOps uh, uh, principle and these kind of things. And of course you could put much more containers uh, on the same server, so it is uh, also optimizing the servers. But uh, really what we see on the field is that uh, people, they have a lot of imagination, right? So sometimes they use uh, uh, pods where they, where, where they should use VMs, especially in the uh, telco field. So 5G is moving to Kubernetes, so everything is moving to pods. And uh, uh, we have seen that customers are just doing like a lift and shift. Uh, from uh, VMs to pods. It means they have like huge pods, uh, which are not cloud native, but uh, well, it works. And uh, we have seen in the other world, like people that just stick to VMs, so they use VMs like they are uh, pods, like Kubernetes pods. It means that in case of issues, they don't uh, jump in the VM to troubleshoot it. They just kill it and start a new one. In case they would like to do an upgrade, they just start new VMs and they kill all, uh, the old VMs. They are really using, in a very smart way, uh, VMs like Kubernetes. So at the end, so don't put yourself under stress. So uh, should I move to containers or not? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's like use your uh, creativity, lose your imagination, and you could achieve a lot of things. And it's the infrastructure that should follow you and not the other way around. So now that we discussed about uh, VMs, containers, or both of them, so actually where to deploy? The first thing and the easiest, of course, would be to go to cloud. So it's very easy with your credit card, for example, you could, you could like deploy on cloud. Uh, it's, uh, it's ideal for small deployments, uh, for startups, and for irregular workload. For example, I met a customer who told me uh, every morning they uh, start like 100 VMs, they collect a lot of data from internet, and then they, they like make reports for their customers. And after two or three hours, they just uh, shut up these VMs. So like the public cloud is perfect for them, right? 
so, however, the downside is that at the beginning it's uh, easy and uh, it works well, it could scale, it's like unlimited, uh, uh, but it has a higher uh, OPEX, and people are talking about like bill shock. It means that they give, uh, especially if they have like a big enterprise, uh, they like give accounts to everyone, and uh, after the end of the month, they end up with like millions, right? Uh, also, so someone could ask question about security and sovereignty. So they say that data is secure, and I believe so, but where is it? Uh, is it behind your firewalls? Uh, so how many security guards you have in the data center? So all these kind of questions, so someone could ask, right? Especially if we are government or banking or these kind of companies. Uh, and uh, also there is vendor lock-in. So it's easy, but when we start using it, it's kind of hard to uh, move away from it. Uh, in the other hand, we could see like on promises. Here, of course, so we have very good security and sovereignty. So everything is behind your firewalls. Uh, you, you have uh, exactly like uh, the good networking, the, like you separate the back end from the front end from the back end relay. So you design it exactly to uh, meet your, uh, your like, uh, security requirements. And of course you have sovereignty. You know exactly where is your server, where is your database located, right? Uh, it has higher capex because you have to buy everything. You have to rent the site or buy the site, rent the, uh, um, uh, it's like buy the servers. Uh, you, you have to buy everything. But if you do the math, uh, after five years, you would see like the, the uh, TCU, the, the total cost of ownership is lower. Is much lower, and this is like something that we do with Mirontis. We do the math, the calculation, and we see that people are really having back a lot of money. Uh, and of course, it's yours, so you could like design it to fit exactly what you need. You put the services that you need, like it's yours. Uh, so the downside, and I think that this is the biggest downside, is that you really have to right size it. And it's kind of hard. So if you have, uh, if we have here like uh, some infrastructure, uh, uh, I would say responsible, so they know about it. Usually we go to the project managers and say, okay, uh, so do we have like uh, some uh, projects coming in the next one, two or three years? Uh, and then you convert it in the amount of servers you need and then you buy the servers. Um, and uh, uh, if for example, you would need 100 servers and you put 150, it means that you are paying uh, 50 servers, maintenance costs for nothing, it's a waste of money. And if you put uh, less, uh, so this is even worse because you will go with uh, overload. So this is, I think, the hardest point that we see with uh, our customers. Uh, also, you would need like to handle everything, like physical side, cabling, cooling, energy. Uh, in my previous company, I could even download AutoCAD uh, in order to know exactly where to put uh, the shelves. Uh, and also you would need multiple skills. Uh, of course, you need like the guy who's doing the cabling is different from the uh, cooling, is different from the energy. It's, it's, uh, it's like a, a lot of people that are needed in order to, uh, to maintain this on-premises infrastructure. There is a solution in between. Uh, it's called like a co-located cloud or metal cloud. Uh, so this is like something that we see more and more. It means that instead of deploying uh, in cloud, like AWS or Azure, whatever, you rent servers on cloud, like with Equinix Metal, for example. So you have your own servers, uh, and then you put on top of them uh, the needed infrastructure, like uh, uh, Kubernetes or OpenStack or whatever. And sometimes, like with Mirontis, uh, you have, uh, actually, uh, we have a very good partnership. It means that you go to this partner and he would take care of deploying everything. And you just use your cloud like it's uh, some uh, public cloud. So this is very good alternative. It's between like the cloud and on-premises. So you don't need to wake up very early in order to get the servers, which is happening nowadays. So they already have thousands of servers uh, and you reduce the, the cost. 
It's also very easy to use because it's based on APIs. So it's uh, like a self-service. So in order to wake up a server, you, you don't need to go to the API and Pixie and these kind of things. You just need to go to some API in order to wake up like uh, thousands of servers, right? And uh, so, and if you do the math, it's kind of, uh, it would lower your uh, cost if you compare it to some uh, hyperscaler. Uh, but of course, it's a bit more expensive than uh, uh, on-premises network. And uh, the good thing here is there is no vendor lock-in because you just have metal. You just have like servers and uh, networking and these kind of things. And then you deploy your own solution on top of it. Uh, it means there is no vendor lock-in. And about security, so it is, uh, uh, it would never be as uh, secure as what you, you have behind your firewalls, of course, but it's, it's much more secure than uh, uh, the normal uh, public cloud because here you could have your own tenants, you could have your servers, you, you secure them like you have, uh, you could have as well your uh, own like uh, uh, private networks. It means in terms of security and sovereignty, it's better than uh, public cloud. Uh, if we would like to push things further, we could talk about, uh, uh, about hybrid cloud. So here, of course, you gain in uh, terms of agility. It means that uh, if uh, you uh, went to see this program manager saying that, uh, listen, do we have project coming in the next a few months, he would say no, and then he comes back, he say, oh, listen, I have actually a project, would take uh, like 100 servers, yeah. Here, if you have hybrid cloud, you could like offload this uh, extra load to the hyper cloud, and this was, would uh, help you, of course, to right size your on-premise cloud. It means that your on-premises cloud would be used for the regular workload, and if you have some uh, uh, project which is not, uh, uh, which was not planned, or some peaks. Uh, especially, I have seen that in uh, uh, telcos. Actually, uh, 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 all the telco network is uh, uh, sized for the peaks. It's like a size for uh, uh, Christmas at uh, eight. Um, and then, uh, 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 all the rest of the year, it is like running very low, which is a bit of pity, yeah. So this hybrid cloud would really help you to size it correctly, right? The downside is that uh, you need like your on-premises skills, but you need another team like handling this, uh, uh, how to say, like uh, uh, public cloud. It means that you need more skills and you need to maintain a different kind of environment. And uh, if we push things even further, we talk about multi-clouds. Uh, in this case, we are having our in-premise cloud, for example. We are having not only one hyperscaler, but multiple hyperscalers. It has uh, a lot of benefits, of course. Uh, for example, uh, avoiding the uh, vendor lock-in, because as you are using multiple uh, uh, hyperscalers, it means that all your uh, uh, development is, uh, 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 is used to work with uh, different hyperscalers. It means that you do not have uh, vendor lock-in. It could be used as well for cost arbitrage. So today, maybe AWS is uh, maybe cheaper, you could use it. Tomorrow, maybe Azure is uh, cheaper, you could use it. Oh, this is like something that I have seen in Telco as well, uh, where they carry voice. So every day they switch from one carrier to another one in order to reduce the prices. So they, they have this possibility. And of course, we have seen that uh, even with the bigger hyperscalers, from time to time, it's slow, there are outages. Uh, so uh, yeah, it could happen. So in this case, you just switch to another one. Uh, the downside of uh, this multi-cloud is, so if you think that hyper-cloud is uh, difficult, so multi-cloud is even more difficult because you have to maintain uh, multiple IPIs, multiple like monitoring systems, um, and it, it's becoming very complex, and everyone knows that uh, complexity is the enemy of security, right? Uh, so it makes things uh, even uh, worse in terms of uh, security.
this is so just to give you an idea about uh, the key component that someone might have uh, with the infrastructures. So we see that we could have like virtualization uh, world. We could do it, for example, with OpenStack, right? We could have containerization world. We could do it with uh, Kubernetes or Swarm or there are other solutions. Uh, but the idea is that we should have one single uh, orchestrator in order to handle all this uh, world, right? And uh, while doing uh, uh, this infrastructure, we should really uh, uh, look for LMA, like uh, login, monitoring, alerting, and billing. And we will talk about this question uh, in the coming slides more in detail. Uh, and also, so someone should not forget about, uh, uh, about the registry, repository, and the whole CACD that should be secured. This is the idea. So at the end, what's an ideal cloud? So this is like a vision. Uh, so if there is one slide that you should uh, keep in mind, maybe it's this one. <laughs> uh, so an ideal cloud is like a smaller or a downsized version of, uh, uh, of a hyperscaler, which is uh, on-premises. Uh, it should be agnostic to the underlying uh, layer. So today we have uh, OpenStack, we have VMware, we have, uh, I don't know, like uh, Kubernetes, we have Swarm. But tomorrow, who knows? It means that while building your ideal cloud, you should really keep in mind that it should be uh, agnostic and you should like do all your development uh, in some agnostic way. It's very important. Otherwise, in five years, you would need to rebuild from scratch, right? Uh, it should be also designed uh, by having the, the time to market in mind, very important, because this is what would give you, uh, I would say, a competitive advantage, so against your competitors, right? It's always the, the, the time to market. And uh, in order to achieve that, uh, it's very important that uh, it should be like with uh, unified access, uh, it means if I have to do something, um, I should not uh, be logging there, logging here. It should be like one access, and it should be with uh, with uh, self-service. Um, I used to work in uh, some uh, companies in the past, where in order to have your, for example, database service, you have to go to the networking team to, to, to get some scopes, and then to the firewalling team to open the, these scopes, and then to the, uh, uh, I would say, uh, to, to the DB team, and there, there and this. And it would take like a few weeks. It would make it a project where it should be very, very easy. So it should be really uh, like a, a, a self-service. Also, it should provide from scratch, uh, most of the services that your company need. Uh, for example, if I need uh, like DB, I don't know, like MySQL or Cassandra or whatever, uh, it should be by self-service, within a few clicks, I get my database. It should not be like a project and go into the team and it, it would take like weeks. It should be within a few clicks. So same for uh, like a backup as a service and same for VPN as a service and for all the uh, uh, services that you might need, we could see that we could really automate them um, and uh, it should be uh, used like, a, uh, like a directly through self-service. Uh, even the security should be automated. I would say like 80% of security could go through some uh, templates and uh, CICDs and like DevSecOps principle. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, it is like something that could waste a lot of time. So, so we should really look for this kind of automation. And uh, there is like uh, something else, which is monitoring. So we should have very good idea about what's happening in our platform. Uh, so is it working well? Is it uh, like at 80% I should like scale it? Uh, we should have all the alarms at, at all like levels, like the, uh, the networking, the servers, and what's on top of it. So the full stack should be monitored. And uh, also there is uh, like something which is very important, but uh, it's very hard to do, which is having a true granular uh, billing. Uh, because today, if we go to hyperscaler, we know how much it would cost me a project. 
Uh, it means that I, I, um, I could see that uh, uh, like uh, uh, this project is uh, costing me, uh, how to say, like uh, I would say 100 uh, VMs. Uh, this has a certain cost, but if we do it uh, uh, on premises, it's kind of hard because we know how much the infrastructure is costing. So how much the site is costing, how much the cooling, how much the electricity, how much the servers. But we, c we cannot know, and it's very difficult to know, how much really a VM or uh, some Kubernetes cluster is costing within this specific uh, on-premises infrastructure. And this is very important to implement. Uh, and also, it should be hosted uh, so on-premises, of course. Uh, but as we said, it's very important that it should be uh, hyper cloud in order to right size it uh, and to offload all these uh, uh, peaks and uh, special events and in order to, uh, 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 how to say, uh, 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 not oversize it. So in order to implement this uh, ideal cloud, so basically you have two possibilities. So either you do it yourself with specific team, uh, so you dedicate a specific cloud team in order to do that, and we have seen uh, a few customers that are doing it uh, themselves. In this case, we have seen a few challenges. First one, of course, is, uh, is uh, talent uh, scarcity. It's very difficult to hire uh, infrastructure talents and even more difficult to maintain them. By the way, we are hiring with Minotis. So, yeah. uh, also, what we have seen is that uh, um, actually we do not want to have outages. This is why our customers, they take their best elements and they uh, put them in order to handle infrastructure, which is a misusage and it's a pity because instead of doing like innovation and very interesting things, th so they are, uh, they are just uh, stuck with the infrastructure, which is really a pity. And uh, also what we have seen is that, so as it's not their like day-to-day -day business, so usually, so the software is uh, outdated, is not maintained, this would lead to outages, to, to, to like uh, uh, security issues and uh, these kind of things. And also like implementing uh, the needed uh, telemetry is kind of hard. So people, they just implement something very easy with nodules or these kind of things, which is not enough in order to view the full uh, stack. So these are the challenges uh, we see. So if you would like to do your infrastructure your own, so you have to keep in mind these kind of challenges because you might run in the same issues. The other alternative would be to go with a partner, uh, so like Mirantis, for example. In this case, you have a few elements that you should keep in mind. Um, so the first element is a very rapid and quick deployment. It means that from the time that I have my, uh, all the needed requirements, uh, uh, I have like my, my servers which are uh, connected in shell, so how much time it would take to um, uh, have something up and running. Usually it's like a couple of days, especially if you go with the uh, uh, reference architecture of your partner. It means that they tested this at their, uh, uh, in their labs. They have like hundreds of customers using this same like reference architecture. So the idea is that it could be very, very quick uh, deployment. The, the second thing that you should be looking for is uh, uh, would it really reduce the, uh, uh, the overhead? It means that uh, uh, we are talking about like day two. So this platform is up and running, but it needs to be maintained, upgraded. We need to look for, for the lifecycle management. So will this partner uh, look for this lifecycle management? So uh, uh, do they have like automated tools? Uh, so how it is working? Would it be easy? So um, uh, uh, so here it's uh, um, I should be like a user of my own platform. It's just, I go to my platform and I start consume VMs, containers, and, uh, 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 and uh, services. The other point is uh, 
So this partner should help me to bring back my workload. So today I'm using some uh, cloud. Uh, I am in this vendor lock-in. So usually these partners, they have experience by moving back the workload. So this partner, um, I should uh, so ask the right question to see whether they have the needed scripts, whether they did it, how is it working. And uh, yeah, uh, this is very important in order to help you to move back all the uh, uh, workload. And uh, also, so today you may be leveraging uh, VMs or containers, but you should, you should look for someone who has both, basically. Uh, uh, because today you might be having like VMs, but uh, tomorrow maybe you would need to leverage the cloud native principles. So you would like to move, for example, to uh, containers. So your partner should offer this possibility to have uh, both at the same time. Uh, so in summary, so you might be leveraging uh, like uh, containers or uh, VMs, you might be having like on-premises uh, or uh, let's say like uh, uh, on, uh, 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 on cloud or both. So, uh, so just reach out, uh, we are in booth uh, B2 and let's discuss about your uh, journey and uh, see how to share ideas because it's very important. I mean, the most important thing is the idea and then we see how to implement it. So thank you for this uh, session. And uh, let me put again this uh, scavenger hand. So if you would like to, uh, yeah, take it. Thanks a lot.
open? No, I can open it. So hello everyone, um, I'm Elvira Garcia and today I'm going to talk about how to contribute to Neutron, a one-on-one -on -one session. I've been working at Red Hat for a year and a half and I'm going to try to get you some, along some of the key things that I think that helped me to get uh, introduced into the Neutron project. So what is this talk about? First of all, uh, I'm going to make a brief introduction to the Neutron service and what's its role in OpenStack. Then I'm going to list you some of the reasons that I think there are uh, to contribute to this project or really to any OpenStack project or any open source project. And then I'm going to try to tell you some of the key things in order to get to fix your first bug in Neutron. So first of all, uh, Neutron is the OpenStack networking service. In OpenStack, um, there are many different services that allow for many different capabilities in the cloud. Some of them are optional and some of them are core. Neutron is one of those <laughs> core components because it allows for all the wiring of the instances that we want to deploy either VMs or bare metal, and not just that, it also wires the services between themselves. The main components in Neutron are the Neutron server that uh, gets all the API calls to the, ser to the service itself, the Neutron DB that has all the information about the networks that we defined, because since we have software-defined networks, we need to save the state and the definition of all the routers, the networks, the subnets that we create, and also the plugins and drivers. The plugins are, you could say, where the magic is. It's where the capabilities are really coded. And one of the most uh, core plugins inside of Neutron would be the ML2 plugin that is a framework for creating all kinds of um, link layer resources, like networks, as I said before, different kinds of networks. And inside of a plugin, you can find different ways of implementing that capability. In the case of the ML2 plugin, we find ML2 OBS, which is the open vSwitch backend for the ML2 plugin, and ML2 OBN too, that it works with OBN as the SDN technology on the back. So why I think it's a nice thing to contribute to Neutron? It's really straightforward. The first reason is because you can. It's not with every project that you are able to actually get interested or find a problem and just go into the code base and learn a bit about why something is failing or how something is working. And if 
it's because of a problem you can even go ahead and submit a patch for that. I think that allows for a higher quality of the code and also for higher reliability because there's more people looking into the code than if it was closed source. And there's also public peer reviewing. This means that for a commit to get into the code base, there must be several people reviewing a patch and at least two core reviewers um, stating that whatever you coded into the project is right for to go inside. So the next thing I think it's because you want to learn. So you might just be interested into networking. For example, in my case, when I arrived to Red Hat and I started um, with OpenStack, I only knew what TCP, UDP, and all that kind of really basic stuff. And once I was uh, here for already a year, I've heard much complex concepts like, for example, VLAN transparency or trunk port and all kinds